Uh, hi, I'm Anjali. I'm going to be talking today about applying deep learning to um, sequential data. So, you know, over the past few years, there's been this explosion of um, advancements in deep learning. You hear it a lot in the news. There's all these advancements in research. But as a software engineer, it can be kind of hard to know what actually works in practice, like which advancements do you kind of need to pay attention to, um, like which things are most applicable to what you're working on. So my goal for today is just to kind of share with you some of the techniques that have been useful in my own work. Um, and it's a short talk, so I'm really just going to have time to give sort of the high level intuition for like how and why things work. And then if you find that these are relevant to your work, I'll have some pointers at the end for where you can get started with actually implementing them. And if they're not relevant to your work, then at least you'll be familiar with the terms. So later on when you hear them, you'll know what people are talking about. So um, yeah, there's lots of different kinds of sequential data we've been hearing about today. I'm going to specifically focus on language, human language, not programming language, natural language, um, or written language, text. Text at the end of the day is just a sequence of words. So um, when we're trying to understand sequential models, I find that text is a, a really nice medium um, to kind of use for example. So for example, um, you know, here's an email. We can just take the email and break it into words, and now it's a sequence. Text also happens to be my area of expertise. Um, so just a little bit about me. I'm from a group called the Google Brain Team. We kind of do a mixture of research, software, and applications, all centering around machine learning. I personally work at the boundary of research and applications, what you might call applied research, specifically focusing on anything with language understanding. So one project I recently worked on that I really enjoyed was launching Smart Reply. Smart Reply is where uh, if you're looking at Gmail on your phone, you'll see some suggestions that are automatically created for responses. Um, for that, we used a deep learning model. Um, and I, I thought it was a lot of fun. So some of my examples will, will kind of use that. But um, the general ideas I'm talking about should apply to other types of data too, not just text. OK, so um, the, main, kind of the main tool that I want to talk about today is recurrent neural networks um, and how they're very powerful for modeling sequences of data. And maybe you've already been hearing about them today. Before we can get into recurrent neural networks, we have to start with plain old feed-forward neural networks. So how many of you have seen neural networks before by show of hands? Oh, OK, great. How many of you have actually like, implemented one, maybe like deployed one or something? OK, great. Um, so then we can go really quickly through this. I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page, so I wanted to really quickly cover the basic feed-forward neural network. I'll go quickly through this since most of you have already seen it. Basically, if you've seen neural networks before, you've probably seen this very classic example. This is handwritten digit recognition. The input is an image of a digit that was written by a human. The output is a classification of what digit that is. The basic building block here is the neuron. The job of the neuron is just to learn one little function of the data. It gets the input, which in this case is the pixel value from the image. It learns some weights, and then it computes the dot product of the weights and the inputs passed through a nonlinearity. You put a bunch of these neurons together, you get a layer. You put a bunch of layers together, and you have a deep neural network. Um, now, how do we learn the weights? Through the process of gradient descent. So what that means is you get a bunch of um, examples of data. So in this case, that would be a bunch of images and their labels. Um, and then for each one, you pass it through the neural network. You look at the correct output, what it should have been, the ground truth, what the neural network said it was. You compute a loss, and then you use that to update all the weights just a little bit in the right direction. Do this over the course of all your training examples. And for a problem like this, you can actually learn a very good model, although this may sound like a very simplistic uh, way of optimizing it. Um, but the key takeaway, the key thing here is just that the neural network is learning everything from the data. So of course, there's no programmer sitting there saying, like, this is what a one looks like. It's like a bunch of you know, pixels in a row like that, or like this is what a two looks like. There's not even someone saying what the different features are. So in traditional machine learning, there's a lot of feature engineering. Neural networks relieve a lot of that. Another way to think of that is that this hidden layer in the middle is an internal representation of the input. The neural network is learning its own feature representation, how, like what it thinks are the most important features to make its predictions. OK, so that's the kind of quick two-minute primer on feed-forward neural networks. Now let's talk about recurrent neural networks. So in the example I just showed, um, and in kind of the most popular applications of neural networks, there's one input, one output, an image, and then a classification. Recurrent neural networks handle sequences. So what this means is that instead of just seeing each input freshly, they can see a whole sequence of inputs and not forget the input they saw before. 
Okay, so for example, if our sequence was an email, right? I said an email is just a sequence of words. We can feed that into our current neural network one token at a time. So first it sees the word, let's say the email is how are you. First it sees the word how, and it reads that into its hidden state. Now its hidden state is this internal representation of the word how. Then when it sees the word are, it's not gonna forget how. See that box, that blue box, which I'm using to kind of represent the hidden state, has arrows from both the previous hidden state and the word are. So what that means is the new hidden state is a function not just of the current input, but also of the previous hidden state. And so on, it reads each token in, and by the end, after it's seen this whole email, it's a very short email, how are you, we think of this hidden state of the model as this internal fixed length encoding of the message. So what do I, why am I saying fixed length encoding? Because the sequence could be any, any number of um, tokens long. It could be a 200 word email. But I, as the programmer, am gonna set the size of that hidden state to something like maybe 512. And so what it means is no matter how long that email was, it's going to encode it in 512 floating point numbers. Now, that might sound strange to you. You're thinking, how can you take any arbitrary email and put it into this, you know, just 500 floating point numbers? This is kind of part of the magic of neural networks, is that through this process, it's really forced to extract the most important information. It's, this is kind of like a bottleneck. It's acting like a bottleneck to take like this very large, sparse, you know, highly variable input and compactly represent it in its own way. And depending on the objective, it's forced to do that in a very efficient way. So our hope would be that different emails that are very similar, like, how are you? How are you doing? What's up? They're all gonna have very similar encodings just because this is acting as a sort of bottleneck that's, that's pushing things together. Okay, so now that would be useful if we were just trying to um, learn to classify an email, like by sentiment or by topic. But now what if we wanted to not just uh, encode an email, but then also generate one, like in Smart Reply. Um, so as I said, this is a project that I enjoyed a lot, so um, let's use that as an example. So for that, we'll use something called the sequence to sequence model. A sequence to sequence model consists of now two recurrent neural networks. One is called the encoder, which is going to read in the incoming message, and the other one is called the decoder, which is going to generate the reply message. So now, what we're gonna do is exactly what we did before, where we read in the input one token at a time, how are you, to get that um, internal representation. So now the neural network has this, this uh, fixed length encoding that is kind of speaking its language. Now, conditional on that, the decoder, we're gonna use that to initialize the decoder, and then conditional on that, the decoder is gonna predict the reply one token at a time. So in this case, something very simple, I am great. Okay, and so the combination of these neural networks is what we call the sequence to sequence model. And this whole thing can be learned end to end with the right data. In our case at Google, this was a um, historical corpus of Gmail. And the idea is that by, again, just by gradient descent, like I explained before, all the parameters can still be learned. So there is still no feature engineering in terms of what what are important things to take out of the incoming email and you know, how to generate the output email. Basically, having the right objective along with the process of gradient descent tells the encoder to learn the best possible representation of the incoming email and allows the decoder to learn how to generate a reply email conditional on that representation. So um, <clears throat> I'm almost out of time, but just uh, a couple examples. These are just kind of um, fully generative examples where we fed a message into the model and looked at what comes out. So things like, can you do Tuesday or Wednesday? It says things like, I can do Tuesday or I can do Wednesday. Um, this is another example I really like. Um, I feel so gross, I think I did something bad, and it says things like, feel better and what's wrong? And um, as you can see, it's doing things like using emojis, asking questions, um, kind of like showing some empathy, but these are not like things that we programmed into it. This is just kind of like learned from the corpus of email. So presumably this is what people do when you say that you're not feeling well, which, which is kind of nice. So um, yeah, the key things, again, it's kind of a quick talk. I apologize for glossing over a lot of things, but the key things I wanted to convey are just that neural networks learn these feature representations from raw data and uh, reduce the burden of feature engineering. Recurrent neural networks take this one step further and allow you to do this with sequences. They can extract the features from sequences and the sequence sequence model is now two of these recurrent neural networks put together, um, and it can still be trained end-to-end -end in the same way. 
So uh, a couple quick applications from Google. There was Smart Reply, which I mentioned. Google Translate also uses this type of model, the encoder decoder. Now the encoder is encoding a sentence in one language. The decoder is decoding it into another language. But as you can see, this should look very familiar from what I showed you before. It's basically the same model architecture. Uh, some more recent research developments, which I'll skim through because I am out of time. What's next? That's up to you guys. Hopefully something in here uh, you know, maybe inspired some application in your own work. And I just wanted to mention a few pointers. This is probably the most important slide. The few pointers for if you want to um, explore these things on your own. The TensorFlow tutorials I like because they're not just how to use TensorFlow, they teach you about machine learning while they're doing it. And there's a really good one um, that's called seek to seek and that's exactly the model I showed you, the sequence to sequence model. This particular tutorial allows you to actually build a machine translation model on a, a public data set for machine translation. And it's really exactly what I showed you. Um, and then finally, this is a colleague of mine, has a really great blog where he breaks down these ideas and explains them really well. He's a great writer, so I, I always recommend it to people who are getting started in this area. Okay, that's all. Thank you for listening.